happy Monday to Brain Balance Live. My name's Jen. I'm a fellow Brain Balance balance parent, excuse me. And this is Heather, who is a wealth of knowledge. She is a cognitive specialist, a therapist, one of the National Autism Summit speakers. This program has been verified, touted by several entities. Uh, today, though, we are dealing with possible weather, Heather. Do you want to just get right into the topic? I think that's a good idea. There, There is a decent chance I'll lose power during this. So. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, the week before Labor Day, we talked about issues with the act of writing, the physical act of writing, and I gave a lot of tips. And so today I'm going to talk about difficulty with written expression. If it's not the motor thing, but it has to do with language, executive function, et cetera. But just to tie these two shows together, I will say that, uh, reiterate that lack of handwriting automaticity. In other words, kids are having to think about how to hold the pencil, how hard to press, sizing, forming, spacing the letters. The more effort goes into that, the less, hi doggy, um, the less space <laughs> <laughs> there is in my brain to think about what it is I want to say. It is high, lack of handwriting automaticity is highly predictive of decreased quality and quantity of content written, as well as reading for deep understanding years down the road. So I love that. And last week, actually, since you touched on that, if anybody does want to go back and watch that show, Heather gave lots of tips on how to help the physical. So there were lots of tricks in there. So make sure you go back and watch that if you're looking for those. But today you're kind of uh, talking about the expression part, right? I am I, in allergies. That, that's good timing. But yeah, we need to move <laughs> right on into the slides. So Written expression, it is, it goes back to language. I did a show a long time ago and talked about how almost always learning disabilities are not the root cause of what's going on. They're just a label for challenges a child is having. For example, dyscalculia, just difficulty with math, but why do they have difficulty with math? Language underlies every single subject. And so even when you, when you hear the word, when you're getting your child tested at school or, or privately, and you hear the term specific learning disability, it's a disorder, one or more of the psychological processes involved in understanding or in using language spoken or written, which may manifest itself as an imperfect ability to listen, speak, read, write, spell, or do math. So usually, a lot of times this is diagnosed first, but sometimes kids, I, I, I've said this before, but it, it bears repeating. A child may talk your ear off in social language, but if you did not know what they were talking about, it was an unknown context. Would you know what they're saying? Do they use a lot of generic terms? There's a difference between social language and academic language. And sometimes kids are good in academic language and not the social. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about all that. But um, but understand that even if it's not like, oh, it's dyscalculia. Oh, it's why? Why do they have dyscalculia? That is not the answer. You have to dig deeper. So for schools, it helps them know, okay, these are accommodations uh, that will be helpful, but you're not taking care of the underlying problem. So there are lots of different areas of language. So your child may have an issue in one area and not another. So you got the phonetics, the phonology, you know, this, the sound letter correspondence. Phoneme is the smallest unit that can make a difference in a meeting, but can't hold meaning by itself. So in other words, car and cars, the phoneme S makes it plural. It changed the meaning of it. That's what phonology is. Um, morphology. Tons of research lets us know that when you're good with morphology, vocabulary and literacy go absolutely astronomically through the roof. This is prefixes, suffixes, uh, things that, that change the meaning of the word in that way. So now you're, you, phonology is um, the sound and morphology is the building blocks from which you can just create thousands of different words. So if kids come across a word they don't know, or they're trying to write, a, a, look up a th thesaurus, like what's another word I can use? Even if they've never heard a certain word before, they go, well, re means again, <laughs> and meant means, and, and then they can figure out what that, and figure out what the root word is, and now they understand it, and they have more words they can use. Um, syntax is putting sentences together. That is sentence structure. So a lot of kids who have grammatical issues, sometimes, um, and I do want to clarify that if we have kids who are bilingual, and you conjugate verbs differently, or uh, like in Spanish, 
if the adjective, the descriptive word comes after the noun in, in English, it usually comes before, that would not be a disorder if they're learning English, because that is a cultural thing. That is a, it's explained by language, uh, their bilingual uh, status. Right. Semantics, meanings of words, and more about, the, so a lot of vocabulary, lots of literal interpretations. But if I take everything literally, I'm going to be lost because there are lots of metaphors, idioms, similes. This is what trips up a lot of our students. We have some who are very, very concrete, literal, logical, concrete. It's raining cats and dogs here. That doesn't mean animals are falling from the sky. And some of our kids would not know what that means. It's raining hard. Yeah. Um, and so they also need pragmatics. And that is what if there could there be a different interpretation of this? What is the non-literal, the abstract interpretation? This is a, uh, comes into play a lot with our kids who have social communication it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. <laughs> um, you know, picking up on um, body language, tone of voice, facial expressions. I mean, that's body awareness. And there's also some phonology in there. But that is reading between the lines. If, I, if you have kids who struggle with that in their personal lives, there are going to be glitches academically, even if they are not showing up right now. I, I really want to stress that. So many times issues with written language do not get, there's a big group that gets identified around age uh, fourth grade when you're really, it goes next level on the things you're supposed to put together. But then a lot of kids don't get identified until middle school and high school. And then they're thought to be lazy, but it's because the, the level of the written language expression they're expected to do is next level. And yet nobody thinks of that as language because they talk your ear off. You know, they don't have any trouble talking. Yeah. It's totally different when you're talking about um, academic language. It's totally different when you're talking about narrative stories, characters, plot settings, than it is um, expository te you know, textbooks, ac academia, facts, figures, tables, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, let's move on. I feel like there's, I mean, I, there are people, of those of us into adulthood who still some of this language stuff is very difficult to express. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. The thing is, um, and I've, I've shared this before, but about 77% of students in behavioral intervention programs in schools have a language delay disorder at, that, and most of the time it is not identified because you have, to, it has to be so substantial for it to count as a, a language disorder in the schools. And so these this is not obvious. You would think that a language disorder is obvious, and so often it is not. Know that a lot of times if kids are pronouncing words incorrectly, there can be a sensory motor planning component to that, which is also going to change their background knowledge, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But it can also be really issues perceiving the sounds correctly, then it's much harder to get it automatic. The sound goes with this letter because some of that gets jumbled up. So another thing that people don't think about, and this is working memory, underlies ADHD, and it, it's not even in the name of that label, working memory is one of the strongest predictors of literacy success as early as pre-K. Working memory is a stronger predictor of academic success at age 10 than IQ is. Working memory means I am having to think and remember simultaneously. I am facing a task, and in, in this show we're talking about writing, I need to pull in my background knowledge my knowledge of all of those layers of language and how you put sentences together and punctuation and capitalization and, and word meanings and what I said in the previous paragraph, what is it connected? You know, I have to pull all of these balls and juggle them and still remember what my thought was that I wanted to put down. Yeah. So the, the format of it is what, like, what's the purpose of the writing? Am I supposed to persuade someone? Is it, you know, opinion piece? Is it a story? Is it a research? You know, I, I need to know what, what format it is. Um, I'm, yeah, that's that style. And format would be like, is it a letter? Is it a research paper? Is it an essay? Is it a, those are not the same thing, but they, they play together. Transition words. And by the way, think about this. If kids don't know that they should speak differently to adults than they do to their peers, they may have difficulty finding different voices in their writing. That is very important. There are some more cues if we know what to look for than are evident on the surface. Yeah. Um, or 
if they have cognitive inflexibility, they may have difficulty switching gears. They can write really good stories. And now they want to use more casual language. And um, no, this is a research paper that that requires a lot of cognitive flexibility, among other things. Transition words. If your kids have difficulty seeing why and how things go together. Big mental schemas of understanding big picture context stuff. They may have difficulty with transition words because um, therefore, da, da, da. Because of this, since this, next. Okay, which ones are the sequencing words? Which ones are the directional words? You know, below, da, da, da. Which ones are a cause and effect? Do your kids know cause and effect? If your kids don't hit a brake pedal and think about cause and effect of their actions, they may have difficulty with cause and effect in writing. Yeah. I love what you said about, you know, this, the IQ not being uh, something that you can base any of this on, because I think so often sometimes, like, especially with, with my Roger, he, he'll jump ahead because his brain has gone through all of the things that like when he's writing, I feel like sometimes it's very choppy because in his brain, he's like, well, of course, all that makes sense. I don't need to write it all out in order for it to make sense to you because he's so smart, you know? And that is exact. That is another thing I have on a different side, but I'm going to say it now because you did. One of the biggest issues that kids will run into. Hi, Debbie. Good to see you. Fellow hat. See you again. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that, that kids run into is being able to, it's point of view. It's called theory of mind. Having the perspective, the flexibility, the big picture to get out of my telescopic view of I'm writing this because I already know what I'm thinking. Being able to put myself into the shoes of the reader and how do I need to word this to where it makes sense to them. Yeah. Being able to understand that they're not in my brain and they don't have access to the things I know. They're only going by what's on the paper that yeah. requires. Do your kids have difficulty putting themselves in the shoes of someone else? Yes. This is how I see it. I'm right. They're wrong. Yeah. They are going to. This is difficult. This is difficult for them. That's on a different slide. But yeah, I'm so glad you said that. But spelling, grammar, the well, audience. I mean, that kind of speaks to that. Who am I? Even that is like I changed the tone. Am I writing um, a Mother's Day card to my mom? Am I writing a, yeah, that's different kind of language than it is if I'm um, writing a persuasive piece. Um, and what is their background knowledge? I need to adjust it. I might need to fill in the blanks. It's kind of like if someone is late to dinner, or a group of friends, you know, you fill in, this is what we were talking about, but we have to do that in our writing. And what we fill in the blanks on depends on our audience. If I'm right, if I'm writing this and a professor's reading it, it's going to be a very scholarly audience versus my my group of neighborhood friends. And I'm just proud of this. I want to show it to you. I mean, it's just different, you know, yeah. but planning and organized, disorganized. If you see disorganization physically, it's cluttered up here. Yeah. Being able to plan, sequence the steps, vocabulary, knowing a lot of our kids for I'll just give you an example. Big and tall are not synonyms. They are both in the realm of size, but one is on one dimension and one is overall. Do they know that? They might end up with incorrect word choice because the granularity of that is difficult. Do your kids have difficulty with granular language? Or is mm. everything happy, sad, mad, black and white? Do they see shades and degrees? Um, you know, punctuation, brainstorming the ideas, all of that has to go on at once. Writing is the most demanding task students do. And it's, it's in every single subject, even in math. Sometimes you have to write out your reasoning for something, but what can we, what can we do to take away that load a little bit? Cognitive load. All of these things are a big load. If you have kids with learning disabilities, ADHD, they are already churning harder. More of their space is getting filled up with things that are supposed to be automatic. They have less of a sketch pad. So this sort of seems obvious, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. How many distractions can you get rid of an organized workspace, especially visual clutter, get rid of it noise. Um, another really good thing that works for a lot of kids with working memory issues is for them to repeat the sentence orally a few times before they write it down, especially if they can tell you this vivid, fantastic story verbally. And then when it goes to writing, it doesn't translate. They're sort of getting um, some memory going. So that part flows and it's not as hard when they're actually having to put pen to paper and think of all the spelling and punctuation and so forth. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of graphic organizers. Outlines can be really difficult. A lot of kids with anxiety don't know how to create an outline because they 
or kids who have difficulty with details and big picture and working together. Everything's the Roman numeral. Everything's the big deal. Instead of understanding this is the main idea or here's my opinion or whatever. Here are the supporting things. Yeah. No, they're all just super important. And so there's that takes away your organization of the paper. Um, this is a big one. I love this one. When when it, when they're going to revise, check for only one error type at a time. So, for example, they they write a rough draft. And by the way, rough drafts are so important. A lot of kids who struggle with um, perfectionistic tendencies think it has to be perfect as they're writing their thoughts down and then they can't get their thoughts down. Talk to them about all the beauty of rough drafts um, and you can practice on a whiteboard where it just goes away and they don't have to. That's a way to kind of wean them off of this kind of perfectionistic tendency. But read through your rough draft. Look only for spelling errors. Read through it again. Look only for punctuation errors. Read through it again. Then you start looking for, was that the right word choice? It's just each time you go through, you're just honing in on one thing so it's not overwhelming. Um, I love that. And I'm going to use that. <laughs> that's a, I love that one. That's one of my favorites. And, of course, when it comes to uh, ARD meetings, IEP 504, and talk to the schools about shorter writing assignments. Can they just show what they know with, with in fewer words or something? Um, sometimes even when, when you just want stream of consciousness and just get these thoughts out because trying to do all of it at the same time is a beating. But they could use abbreviations, which actually makes it easier for those who are sometimes who have perfectionistic tendencies because that is so overtly me not trying to be perfect. Yeah. That then they're more likely to let loose with their ideas and let them flow. Um, and talk to the teacher. Can I turn in a rough draft and get your feedback and it not count against my grades and then go back and make some corrections. That's another good one for, um, ARD meetings, but, and then for, if it's really, really substantial deficits with working memory, maybe you need to be their scribe. They write a sentence, you write one. I mean, this is important to get permission from teachers, but mm -hmm. they come up with the ideas, but it also depends on which part of the process is weighing them down. But um, and there's also lots of technology out there, you know, yeah. te uh, text to type and that kind of thing. OK, let's move on. How cool are those pencils in the brain? Yeah, so cool. Metacognition is thinking about your thinking. It is very much about and when I think about my thinking, I pull in my background knowledge. We have to do this when we're writing. Here's an example of. Um, the student cannot identify what he thinks. We have a lot of kids who don't even have a sense of self they or they're really struggling to learn. So they don't even know what they think about things. If they have sensory processing disorders, they have not had the same exposure to life as other people have had. When I was legally blind, I was talking about how beautiful the ocean water is. I didn't know what they were talking about. A child who's overwhelmed with auditory, that might sound like a tornado coming through and it's not relaxing to them. So their experience is different. There's fewer dots to connect. Um, the student um, can state what he thinks. And, and this is a big one. A lot of our kids get stuck here. It's their opinion, so therefore it's right. And you're <laughs> wrong. Yay. And why do you think that? And they can't back it up. Um, and then the student can state what they think and um, explains his or her logic. So you can see it goes from, I, I think a rhombus is like a square. And then... When I can back it up with logic, it's not concrete facts like proof, but I, um, I, I think it's a rhombus is like a square because it has four sides. That is true. It's not enough because a lot of things have four sides. Right. Um, the student um, states what he thinks, explains his logic with evidence. Papers require evidence, especially when you get a little bit older and you're doing research. And so you have all the same things. And then... Um, I know because I measured them, they're congruent. There's evidence. And then they can do all of those things and compare and contrast it. Um, lots of compare and contrast papers, lots of pros and cons, lots of cause and effect in papers. So um, being able to do that. And then they're different because the sides aren't parallel. And so they're showing how they're alike and how they're different. Ah, that see. is a thought process that our kids go through, not just when they're writing, but in life, in conversations. What's your opinion on vaccination? Ooh, heaven forbid. That's such a, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, that just popped in my head. And, and if, think about 
the layers of conversation we have with people, depending on how invested they are in researching it and that kind of thing, or how, how, how much they do enjoy going and reading research or based on, they had family members who had a good result, bad result, whatever. So we do this all day long. It's important for every aspect of our lives, for conversation, for writing, for reading, for connecting dots, for making sense of the world. A lot of our kids, because they are struggling, are not having the same exposure to experiences, even when they are in the same places with other people. Therefore, they don't have as much to pull on. And therefore, trying to know how to write and connect the dots and compare and contrast and so forth doesn't make sense to them. Does okay. this tie in to empathy at all? Like, or like being able to see from other people's perspective, or is that like a totally different thing? It is not totally different because I first need to understand myself and I'm thinking about my thinking. And then it helps me think about how, what I did may make you think and feel. Empathy is very cognitive. It is not, um, of course there are sweet hearts and everything. But a child can have the sweetest, sweetest heart. But if they don't have that cognitive component, then you're missing it. Because metacognition yeah. and theory of mind, the more I can understand how to think about my thinking, the more I can understand how to think about your thinking. Yeah. And appreciate it. And that's more concrete. And then that lends itself to me being able to think about your feelings. Yeah. So absolutely. Well, metacognition yeah. is everything. This is how we grow independent problem solvers. Yeah. So, so important. it's so important to expose our kids to talk about the things afterwards, not just go do something, but then have conversation. What was your favorite part? Why? Da, da, da. All of that is starting to connect dots and grow metacognition also. Yeah. Love but it. when I, when I read a story about baseball, I'm on a baseball team. I am going to pull in my experience and I'm going to have a deeper understanding of those characters. So then when I'm writing a story, I'm going to be able to flesh out that character more too. And I'm going to be able to come up with a more realistic thing that happened in the baseball game. Right? Yeah. Reading and writing go hand in hand. And metacognition, hands down, and, and pulling in background knowledge is one of the most powerful things you can do to grow literacy from pre-K all the way through high school. I mean, unequivocally, it, it, there's a lot of research on that. And so that's why it's really good to have really meaningful conversations th with your kids. And have them back things up, not where it's an argument, but where it is. And, and a lot of our literal kids enjoy that, but you're also teaching them something. And you could do it on a silly topic so, so it's nothing heated, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Roger says that he wants to get a hairless cat when he's older. Perhaps we could have him tell me he could go deeper on that topic for me. <laughs> Girl, I've got, I've got an exercise to have him do. On a slide coming up here in a minute. That's fine. I love it. <laughs> so um, at the top here, the writing process is, is showing you a lot of the different genres of writing. It's so important for kids to practice with a lot of them. It's also important to let them just free write. If you let them write about what they like sometimes, the, they, they become more automated on some of the things that they're struggling in. And then when they have to do a, a mode of writing that's not as easy, at least some, some of the pieces are automated for them. But... Research shows that self-regulated strategy development, SRSD, trumps process instruction. So in just instead of just teaching the mechanics of writing, teaching them to think about their thinking and the writing process. So they're going to pre-write. They're going to brainstorm, organize their ideas, use a concept map, graphic organizer. If it's a research paper, do research, gather the facts. Then they're going to do rough drafts. And that is going to be hard for kids who have perfectionistic tendencies. But talk to them about the value of it. Um, revise it and, and edit it. So with revising, you're improving the writing. You might be like, I've used this word a lot. Let me pull out the thesaurus so I can find a really a juicy word that's special and yeah. that's not redundant. It, it's, do I need to reword this sentence? Does it make total sense? So you're thinking about the, ex, the, the language expression component. And then the editing is the proofreading, spelling, grammar, too many spaces right there, et cetera, that kind of thing. And then, and then sharing it. It is so great to have them write things sometimes that they just want to write. Like they have them find a really cool picture. I mean, we have so many kids who are into anime right now, whatever it is. And then write a little, write a paragraph, write a story about it, and then share it with grandma. Have everyone sit around and they read it, like celebrate it and make it something that has a positive 
um, connection in their minds. You know, what can you do to make that time special? Have a journal where the, any family member can sit, you know, and, and write an entry in the same journal where it doesn't feel like somebody's going to look at me. It's my journal. It's it's a shared, it's a family bonding thing. I um, love that. And notice self-regulated. If you have kids who are impulsive, they may have difficulty with written expression and not just from being careless. I, it's very important to understand that being able to hit the brake pedal and catch, think about my thinking and catch when what I wrote down didn't make sense or it didn't come out the way I thought it did or that kind of thing. It requires self-awareness. It requires me to hit the brake pedal and to really slow down, take it in, notice where there's a breakdown. I don't have a smooth transition that was very choppy there. This would be confusing to someone who does not have the same background knowledge I do. So working on this will can also improve behavior because you're working on hitting the brake pedal. And you can Google the writing pro, uh, process. There are so many free sheets that come up with these five steps and tons and tons and tons of research shows that it is important for kids to go through these. And, and there will be sheets that will even define what that stage of the process is. And then they do it. You can even take notes when you're reading using that format. And then when it goes to the writing, it's easier. It's sort of a note taking technique as well. But just Google the writing process and lots of free options come up for that. Amazing. Okay. I love that. Let's go on. But graphic organizers. How do you um, <laughs> <laughs> I love, these are awesome, but you, I've told you about the hamburger. I, I used it, at least I used a different hamburger this time. I wanted to, but this is one of the most popular ways to teach younger kids how to write paragraphs because the bun is the introduction then you have the supporting things in the middle. And then you have the conclusion as the bottom bun. It makes literal the abstract concept to them of the components of writing. And, and then they can even put the stuff in the hamburger. What's your hamburger missing? You know, that kind of thing. Um, you, the one in the middle is an example of a, a concept map. So, okay, I have to do expository writing. I've never done that before. And then they can shoot off what the components of that are and put ideas for what they want to include under those components. That's a concept map, just a web. They can just draw circles. You don't need one of these. Um, five finger retail. You know, if they're going to write a story or if they're going to write a summary of a book, that, like a book report, I need the character setting, the problem, the you know, the solution, whatever. Um, there, you, there are these for persuasive writing. This is what I think. And here's supporting details. I mean, any kind of writing, you can pull these up and there are lots of free ones out there. This is, it organizes the brain. It really helps them understand um, the process, the, the components they can more easily go back and see what's missing. It makes it more concrete for them. And, um, and they can even draw pictures with it. It just make it creative. Kids, kids benefit enormously. Yeah. From graphic organizers or concept maps. They're just they, fun to look at. They're fun. They're more fun than for a lot of kids than Roman numeral one, A, B, C, yeah. one, two, three. Yeah. Um, this makes it more kind of creative, artsy, fun to look at. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. I think we did we oh okay um and then this is arguably this is also uh i mean really this is also a graphic organizer but this is specifically called raft technique and that is role audience format topic don't you love you some mnemonics like that i do so, <laughs> so okay wh what is my role as the writer okay i'm writing as a student sometimes Kids will write a story as if that if, if you were the president, write write a letter to da da da. So they really have to think, what role am I taking in this? Um, who's the audience? In this case, he's writing a letter to his teacher. You can see that the format's a letter. The topic, I don't think we should have homework. And then he he knows to include those components, and he has it right there to refer to as he writes his very smart letter about why he shouldn't have homework. Yes, can, can we just it? talk about how smart this parent is for, oh, why don't we organize a letter that yeah. you'll have to write to your teacher about this? Yeah, but you can use this for any kind of paper, any Love kind it. of paper. And another thing to really help kids think about the voice they're using is for when they're reading to ask the, 
get them thinking about what is the, why did the author write this? What was he tr trying to share with me? Yeah. What, what was the purpose behind it? And then it helps them as they're reading it to think about that. And then when they go to writing um, to, to match what they're writing with the purpose of what they're writing. But this really helps with pragmatics because again, I'm thinking about different voice, different purpose. So this helps with social skills, social communication, flexibility, theory of mind. How do I need to word this? This is what I was talking about earlier. So it makes sense to, and is appropriate for the reader. Big picture, why am I writing this? So many of our kids are missing big picture. What's the main idea? What's the context for this? This organizes it, as you can see, and then they can, it, it frees up the creativity because they have the more literal stuff done, you yeah. know, the concrete stuff. Okay, okay. raft, it's brilliant. <laughs> and now a few fun ideas to wrap up here. Um, fun ways to practice writing. Play fortunately, unfortunately. So this is um, like you can sit at the table and somebody writes um, a sentence like, fortunately, I don't have any homework tonight. And then I pass it to Jen and she writes, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's raining. So I can't go outside and play like I want to. Yeah, right. <laughs> fortunately, we're having spaghetti for dinner and I love spaghetti. But anyway, you go around the table, but it ends up, you can create stories out of it. You can, but they, each person is adding on to what the other person is saying. And that way they don't have all the onus of the writing on them. And sometimes it ends up being something really funny and silly. That is and it makes funny. Them laugh. Yeah. Okay. This is the, the hairless cat, honey. Compose <laughs> a convince me letter. Have Roger compose you a convince me letter. <laughs> Tell him to write you a letter convincing you of why y'all should get a hairless cat. <laughs> You know he's allergic. He's allergic, and this is why the the hairless option has come up. Well, then we can get that kind because that kind I wouldn't be allergic to. I love the problem solving there. <laughs> he's too smart for his own good and for I your know. good sometimes. Probably. <laughs> oh, he's so but, writing a convince me letter. <laughs> but think about this. I I know nobody watching ever um has kids who can be a bit obstinate or um defiant or oppositional or anything, but. Tell them, and, and this also gets rid of some yelling and screaming, which we know, safe harbor, but sometimes the escalation happens. Yep. Have them compose you a letter. They're practicing their writing. They're getting their thoughts into paper, and they're using their logical brain, which takes emotion much more out of it, and they're very passionate about what they're writing, so they're interested in the topic. Engaged brains work better. Yeah. It's excellent. I love that. Um, create have them create a blog or an instruction manual and then teach others. So I, we did a show a while back and I talked about having kids like they're doing a Facebook live or something. Remember? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's social media age, have them create a blog about a hobby of theirs yeah. or something, even if it, it doesn't have to have followers. I mean, it can be for the family, right? Yeah. Or have them write an instruction manual. Of course it can be short and then draw pictures, but when they know that they're sharing their expertise and their passion, their hobby, whatever with others, it's just a different format. All writing does not have to be a paper for school. Um, make an I can book growth mindset. And each time yeah, they, they persevere, they do something, something that they were struggling with before I can write full sentences. Now I can uh, hit the baseball all the way into the outfield, you know, and that's fun. It's sort of a different, version in a way of a scrapbook even if kids are little do a picture scrapbook even if kids can only write one word with a picture have a scrapbook a journal you can even have a journal jar and have them pull out a, a and that's kind of fun it's like the surprise of what little writing prompt am i going to pull out today um have them be the parent for the day so you they write the grocery list they write um a recipe down for the next door neighbor. They write whatever you would be writing that makes sense for them. Have them do that. And kids want to be, feel grown up. They want independence and it's short little blurbs instead of long, long, long things. Um, so these are just to kind of get us. Oh, t play. Tell me how. Oh, I love this one. This might be my favorite. Um, so you can say you're writing to an an alien from outer space who doesn't know anything about our world and our the way we do things. So have them write instructions for some everyday task, how to brush your teeth, how to make a sandwich, whatever it is. And then you are the alien and you 
perform the steps exactly as they wrote them. So if they I love them, that. And then they start, it, it gets them more paying attention to all the details and do I have all the information in there I need? And it's super fun and they laugh and it's a learning experience, but it's really, really fun. I think that might be my favorite one. I think I've seen a video of a dad making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich very incorrectly from a tell, tell me how uh, yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. So if you're working on oral language, you can do this verbally, right? But yeah. if, if this is written expression, if, if writing is the concern, have them write down the steps. And then it's really funny when they realize, oh, yeah, the details do matter. I love it. Yeah. When Roger's saying, oh, I don't need to write that. Yeah, that part's <laughs> obvious. Um, but just create a safe space for writing. So I highly recommend working on one skill at a time. If your kids are having a lot of struggles, if you're working on getting a full sentence, a complete sentence written, don't worry about spelling in that moment. I'm not talking about papers you're turning in for school. Like in that moment, get that down. Really just work on one thing at a time. When kids have learning disabilities, disorders of, of written expression, um, because otherwise it's overwhelming and they feel that they can't win and they're going to have such a drudgery about it. But, you know, make the area where they write really have some, something favorite of theirs in it, their favorite color. You know, the, one of the walls is painted that color or a, a pillow that has that's really squishy that they like or something just environmentally. And also just um, it's really important for them to see you writing also. And especially if you write a story together and you do every other sentence or something. Okay. So oh my I gosh, we, we, yeah. we have wrapped it up, Heather. Is there anything else you want to leave us with today on the topic? I just, I like this, this quote from, um, uh, start writing no matter what the water does not flow until the faucet is turned on. That's, you know, just, help them feel success. Remember to always celebrate the small victories. It's not about the end product. It's about progress and, and their perseverance and, and things like that. Even if grammar was a mess punctuation, what a, what a creative topic you thought of. I mean, always look for things to praise about it. What made you think of that topic? Show interest. Um, not about the, the grade, but about progress, perseverance, creativity, that kind of thing. I love it because that helps us create grit, our favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. As you can see, these are all the places where you can find Heather online. Uh, make sure that you're following her at Hidden Churn, as you can see there um, on Instagram and Facebook. Here's the Brain Balance Centers. Uh, find the one nearest you. Get that assessment today. You really will not regret it. Um, Heather, are you going to be doing any more lives this week? Um, I think so. I'm not positive. All right. Usually, we make no promises, yeah. but we will definitely see you next week. Same time, same place. Thanks so much, Heather.